else, then I'm the focus. Yes. Okay. Oh, so, so this is you're speaking to these tiny screens. Yeah. All right. I can see them. Shall I start? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Pickover. I'm the director of the EMS Foundation. We really welcome all of you, whether here physically or online, to this, the first ever African discussion about the role Africa has in sending elephants into captivity and what we need to get them out of the room. We really appreciate your presence and look forward to your participation. And we are so pleased to have been able to bring together a number of key international and local experts in the area of elephants, and more specifically, on elephants who find themselves in captivity. They are from different disciplines, scientists, ethologists, ecologists, lawyers, practitioners, and NGOs. Thank you very much for agreeing to be on our various panels. Very generally, the aim of the Indaba is to highlight who elephants are, place the plight of captive elephants, including the methods of training, into the public consciousness, share the findings of an updated review and audit of captive elephant facilities in South Africa, talk about the need to rehabilitate and rewild elephants who find themselves in captivity, highlight the capture and sale of young elephants from Zimbabwe and Namibia to zoos and circuses in China, Pakistan, and the USA, probe the policy contexts, including trade, sustainable use, and the CITES acceptable destinations issue examine legal interventions in relation to captive elephants, and finally, to come up with recommendations for our collective governments. This event is being held in Amarnas because the Western Cape has the highest number of captive elephants in our country. Moreover, Craig Saunders plans on opening up a captive elephant business in the Amarnas area, and, there's, and, uh, <clears throat> and there is, as a consequence, much local and national discussion. In addition, Hermanus is known for the whales that we are so lucky to have grace us with their presence. This highlights the difference and inconsistent position that South Africa has in relation to different species. In this case, elephants and whales. And it's highly contested interpretation of section 24 of our constitution and its ideological position of sustainable use. So on the one hand, we protect whales on the other hand, we exploit elephants. Although we invited government representatives from South Africa's national and provincial governments to be on the panel, they declined. It is disappointing, but not unexpected, given the dismissive position our environmental agencies take towards ethical and welfare concerns for the wild animals they have oversight and responsibility for. It is their policies that allow elephants and other wild animals to be moved traded, bred, petted, held captive, abused, hunted, and killed. All this despite key constitutional and high court judgments which demand that they act differently. But did an agency such as Cape Nature take up this unique opportunity to expose its staff to elephant ethologists and specialists so that they could understand what their current policies are doing to elephants? Well, sadly, they didn't. In a very real sense, there is a war of attrition. It is being waged against elephants. And in these kind of conditions, governments around the world must understand that we are here to defend the innocent victims. But of course, government is on the wrong side of history. And the intention of an Indaba such as this one is to tell them that they can no longer ignore ethical conservation and all the scientific data that supports it. Our government is also in the process of producing a national strategy on elephants. It's been 10 years since the last elephant assessment. So we also need to make sure that the plight of captive elephants gets back on the agenda. In our SADC region, there is a convergence of issues coalescing around the unacceptable removal and capture of elephants for local and international trade, captivity and profit. From regional and national perspectives, there is a need to connect all these dots into a coherent response. We need to be crafting national legislation that clearly speaks to these issues. There is also general concern and questioning 
about the static position of extractive sustainable use, which is at the heart of their support for the trade in live wild animals and their body parts. Sustainable use falls squarely within the political background over the environment as national resource extraction, which has not only become an increasingly contested and politicized form of development, but human rights abuses are also linked to this extractivism. So set are they on advancing this particular policy agenda that as we have seen at the recent CITES COP meeting, they are seemingly willing to undermine the cooperative integrative spirit of multilateralism and instead are disingenuously invoking notions of sovereignty, which is serving the par parochial and patriarchal interests of only a few. And all of this in the context of the sixth extinction, where global interdependence is huge. As a species, we are on the precipice of annihilation. We need to be reimagining and reinvigorating multilateral responses to the contemporary challenges facing the world, including climate change, massive biodiversity loss, and approaching ecosystem collapse. So enough from me, but before I go, I'd like to introduce you to our chair, John Pinnock. John is a South African writer. He's an investigative journalist and a photographer. He's a specialist and um, well-known person on gangs in our country. He's a research fellow at the Center of Criminology at UCT and a former editor of Getaway Magazine. He has been an electronic engineer, lecturer in journalism and criminology, consultant to the Mandela government and to um, the local Western Cape government. He's a yachtsman, an explorer, a traveler, and an environmental writer. Um, his passions are species conservation in Africa and the relationship between early social and biological trauma and high-risk adolescent behavior. Don has written 17 books covering history, politics, the environment, gangs, and science, including Gang Town, winner of the City Press Nonfiction Award, and more recently, the compilation of the book, The Last Elephants. Thanks, John. Thank you, Michelle. I actually asked her to just introduce me as the chair. I'm the chair. I'm the bad cop here. Um, I'm going to keep the time. Just a couple of process things. Um, we're being recorded. You are being recorded. This is going out live streaming. So but the legal, uh, it's legally necessary for me to tell you that. If you don't like being live recorded, please leave now. Um, the irony of what we're looking at is, the, is that there's a, there's a link between ivory and slavery, and I've always been puzzled and worried about that. You know, until about the, 19, the 1400s, elephants roamed much of Africa. And by the 1500s, Europeans and Arabs had fully industrialized commercialization of both slaves and ivory, and they're tightly linked. Uh, slave caravans carried ivory, the people who carried the ivory were often sold as slaves with the ivory going to Europe. And by the early 20th century, the only safe space for elephants were refuges, refuges, defined parks where they were effectively refugees. Um, slavery has been abolished, but the enslavement of elephants has not been abolished. Poachers are killing 20,000 a, a year. And because of ivory, there's no safety anywhere. But um, we've gone further. We've, we've turned elephants from refugees into prisoners. We put them in smaller and smaller enclosures. We contain them for the entertainment of humans. We're incarcerating them to perform. Um, William Wilberforce and a few dedicated people around him ended slavery. What will it take us? And this is what this conference is about, what it will take us to end the comprehensive cruelties we do to elephants. I think a great leap forward, is, as I'm sure you all know, was taken at CITES uh, last week, prohibiting the sale and transport of wild-caught elephants out of their natural historical range. But we have to go further than that. They, that is elephants in, their, in, in wild spaces. But we have to consider and build an understanding about what to do about those elephants, wild caught or captive, who are already in unnatural confinement for our human pleasure. And 
I, I often take hope in the desperation of what we do to the planet in the, the, the saying of, of that, um, uh, by, by that anthropologist Margaret Mead, she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, our job, as Michelle says, is to come up with a framework in dealing with elephants. Um, I'm the rule keeper. Um, the main, really what this is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a workshop of the people who are sitting here to which the public have been invited. Unfortunately, we can't have a, a huge debate from the floor. Um, there will be debate from the floor, but the speakers themselves are being confined to putting their position in terms of what this uh, conference is about in only 10 minutes. And at nine minutes in each of their, 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 their presentations, I'm going to ring a bell and they're going to be obedient and wrap up one minute later. Um, I hope that will happen. There is. There will be questions, they are WhatsApp questions, if you want to take down the WhatsApp number, um, and then we will deal with those in the discussion time. Um, the, it is plus 27, which is South Africa, and if you are South African in your cell phone, it's 071-771-2814. Um, Have you got that? It's 0, 027, and then it's the zero is bracketed if you're coming from outside. It's 071-771-2814. Uh, the first panel is going to be why elephants are important and who they are. Now, um, we have Dr. Joyce Poole, who will be live streaming. She's joining us. I, I hope she's here. Yes. Hello, welcome Joyce. <laughs> um, yeah. Joyce is world-renowned elephant researcher. She's one of the most world-renowned elephant researchers in the world. She's a coordinator of Elephant Voices, um, research, conservation, advocacy organization, advocating the study of elephant cognition, communication, and social behavior, and promoting the scientifically sound and ethical management and care of elephants. She's an ethologist, ecologist, conservation biologist, a world authority on elephant reproductive communication, cognitive behavior. Uh, she's a leading voice for the protection and well-being of elephants, and she will be addressing who elephants are and why they are not suited for captivity. Dr. Keith Lindsay here is a conservation biologist, and environmental consultant based in Oxford, his expertise includes project design, management, monitoring, evaluation, biodiversity, research and conservation, community-based natural resource management and po policy analysis. That's a lot of things you do, Keith. <laughs> In Africa, Asia and the Americas, which is even bigger. Um, and his broader concerns include the ivory trade under CITES and the welfare of captive elephants. Uh, he's going to be talking about why ecosystems need elephants and elephants need ecosystems and why elephants need to live in the wild and not in captivity. Um, Audrey Delsink is second from the, the right. Um, she's wildlife director of the Humane Society International Africa. Among other things, she champions humane population control alternatives. Uh, she's been a champion of that for some time in human wildlife conflict solutions and challenges in captive lion breeding and trophy hunting. She's a field director for the African Elephant Immunocontraception Program. Um, Audrey's going to be talking about elephant value, rands and cents, S-E-N-S-E. -E. Uh, Dr. Yolanda Pretorius, second along on the left. She's wildlife director of Humane Society. No, no, she's not. She's uh, manager <laughs> of the Higher Education Training Program um, at the Southern African Wildlife College. She's uh, vice cha chairperson of the specialist advisory group, trustee of Elephant Reintegration Trust. Uh, she's run research programs of reintegration of captive elephants. Today, she's gonna be comparing the stress of elephants in captivity, elephants in the wild, and rehabilitation or reintegration of elephants. Um, Antoinette van der Waarte is in the middle. Uh, she's director of Bring the Elephants Home. She's had over 15 years' experience in community-based elephant conservation. She's won three 
Conservation Awards. She's the co-author of The Great Elephant Escape. She featured in several documentaries. She's a trustee of Elephant Specialist Advisory Group. Antoinette will be talking today about the value of elephants for society and conservation strategies that reconcile conservation and human well-being goals. Um, a couple of completely obvious things, which I shouldn't have to tell you. Please turn off your cell phones. Um, and um, just before we start, I, I want to uh, invite somebody up here who's very important. And that is, um, I just want to, sorry, I'm crippling my paper. Um, is, uh, 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 yeah. um, Chief Stephen Fritz, he's the, um, the chief of the South Peninsula Customary Hoi Council. And I'm going to ask uh, Chief Stephen to officially open this conference. Chief, would you join us, please? Kainke Kainche are Otsumato Kainche are Krotoa Kainche are Tsawa Kainche are Poitsua Gangans Kai Gangans Gangansi Kotasi Tielote Tielote Gangans. Mr. Chair, honorable members, I have just greet all of you and welcome all of you. And those who are not from Cape Town, I have welcomed you in Cape Town. And I've invited the ancestors of the Khoisan people and the spirit of the lion and the spirit of the elephant to be among us. For me, as a senior chief of the Khoisan Nation, it's a privilege, it's an honor to be here and to be part and parcel of this in Daba. Because um, elephants are one of the most important animals in the Khoisan history. And our history, the Khoisan history, were never recorded, but it was passed on from generation to generation. And our history will still get on rock art painting. Now, uh, part of our history was that um, when the colonial people arrived here in Cape Town, the last two African elephants were in the Franz Hook area. So those elephants, the mother and cup, they have seen the op oppression and they starting to lead the way. And they move over the Franz Hook mountains and everywhere they have moved, they have bring peace and harmony, and a lot of his fellow men follow them. Even the Khoisan tribes follow them to peace and freedom. Now you see how important elephants is for the Khoisan people. Elephants is the sacred animal to the Khoisan nation. It is called Pau Itzi. 
which means elephant. And those of us living in the Cape area maybe heard a place called Elephant's Eye. That was the place where the Khoisan princess lived. And on top of the cave, there's a rock formation of the elephant. And that's why the Khoi people call it elephant's eye because there's two water streams flowing down that runs into the wetlands. So this elephant is protecting those two streams. Then again, in our, my culture and in my history. Elephants are sacred because we honor them. We lived with them. We dance with the elephants. The Khoisan nation lived in small groups. Each group had a, med a medicinal healer, a traditional healer. And once a few people get sick in a clan, the traditional healer will do the moon dance, which most of us know as the trans dance. Then he will call on the spirit of the elephant and he will draw the elephants near so he can take the power of the elephant to heal the sick and to make rain. And that's why for the Khoisan people, the elephants are known as the rainmakers. But we are the Khoisan people have a problem. And it's not a concern for us. But we are angry as the Khoisan nation. Because our elephants getting killed every day for the ivory. Our elephants are enslaved. Our elephants are in captivity. Now that is what makes the Khoisan nation angry. I don't know how many, all of us know that South Africa is facing a water crisis. And you know why? Because you're killing the rainmaker, which is the elephant. You kept up the rainmaker, which is the elephant. You enslaved the rainmaker, which is the elephant. That is why we're facing a water crisis in South Africa. Mr. Chair, honorable members, my message that I have and I want to brought over to all of us here from the Khoisan nation. Free Poichi. He was born to be free. Like all of us was born to be free. Free. Because if you put an elephant in captivity and train him, you not train the elephant, but you abusing the secret animal of the Khoisan nation. So while elephants are in captivity, the Khoisan nation are in captivity. Why? You killing the elephant, you killing the Khoisan nation. You enslave the elephant, you enslave the Khoisan nation. So I say today, enough is enough. We as the Khoisan nation, of South Africa and Southern Africa have come together and we decided that we will fight 
till the very last end to see and to make sure that the elephants are free. And that's why today I will tell you, a two atamakam ske. A two atamakam ske. A two atamakam ske. Mr. Chair, honorable members, my message to you is as from today, we, are the, we as the Khoisan nation, we will fight and protect what is rightfully belongs to the Khoisan nation, and I thank you. Thank you. I'm speaking about uh, who are the elephants and why they cannot thrive in captivity. Elephants are large and long-lived, physically impressive and vigorous. An adult male African elephant may be four meters tall and weigh as much as 7,000 kilos. No other terrestrial animal alive today weighs half as much. With a maximum lifespan in the wild of over 70 years, African elephants are unusually long-lived mammals. Elephants are wide-ranging. Elephants range from sea level to over 5,000 meters, inhabiting deserts, swamps, lowland rainforests, montane forests, upland moors, floodplains, open savannas, woodlands, and thriving in temperatures from between 15 to 40 degrees centigrade. An elephant's home range varies between individuals and populations, but may attain as much as 11,000 square kilometers. Elephants are adapted to landscape living with specialized physical and behavioral adaptations to large landscapes. For instance, a pharyngeal pouch to pull them through long, hot walks without access to water, or their very low frequency, uh, powerful vocalizations that allow them to communicate with one another over great distances. Elephants are big eaters with an eclectic diet Elephants spend almost three quarters of their lives acquiring food. Grasses, herbs, leaves, roots, branches, bark, seed pods, lianas are all on the menu. And through the coordinated action of feet, tusks, dexterous trunk, an elephant plucks an individual item of fruit, grasps tufts of, tufts of grass, tusks open, heart of palm, flattens the hard thorns of an acacia branch, removes the leaves from a branch or pries bark off trees. Slow meandering carries an elephant from one food item to another. Purposeful walking takes an elephant through a variety of habitats on daily forays and seasonal migrations. Elephants are masters of techniques to suit the menu. Each species of food item in each season is eaten using a special technique. And the physical activity and mental stimulation involved in the search for food items, walking, reaching, smelling with the trunk, and their manipulation, digging, kicking, stabilizing with the feet, prying, levering, breaking with the tusks, pulling, ripping, breaking, defoliating, cleaning with the trunk, constitutes the very core of an elephant's interest and survival. And many of these techniques used by elephants to locate, select, and extract food must be learned, either through experience or by watching others. And social learning plays a critical role in a calf's acquisition of foraging knowledge and the techniques of manipulating food items. Elephants have an unusually large social network. Elephants com 
complex fission fusion society is remarkable for its fluidity on the one hand and its very close and enduring social relationships on the other. Relationships radiate out from the mother offspring bond through family, bond group, clan, subpopulation, independent adult males, and even beyond to strangers. Adult males too form long-term friendships among age cohorts and relatives. And in the course of a single day, an elephant may socialize with hundreds of other familiar individuals. <clears throat> Elephants have a rich behavioral repertoire. The behavioral repertoire of African elephants includes over 300 postures, gestures, displays, and calls. They use their voice, mouth, tusks, eyes, trunk, ears, tail, feet, glandular secretions, and entire bodies to communicate. Through these signals, we observe elephants to contemplate, indicate, comfort, <clears throat> assist, guide, express emotions and desires, communicate plans of action, discuss what to do, negotiate, collaborate. Their voices range from eight hertz to 9,000 hertz <clears throat> and include over 40 different calls in the form of low frequency rumbles and higher frequency trumpets, snorts, screams, barks, roars, cries, croaking and other learned and idiosyncratic calls. Elephants are large brained and intelligent. They have very large and complex brains. At an average of 4.8 kilograms, the elephant brain is the largest among living and extinct terrestrial mammals. Elephants have the greatest volume of cerebral cortex available for cognitive processing of all land mammals. The neocortex, the seat of enhanced cognitive function, such as working memory, planning, spatial orientation, speech and language is large and highly convoluted. Their atypical long matriarch neurons suggest an animal that is both contemplative and deliberate. Elephants are intelligent, self-aware, empathetic animals with an understanding of life and death. They care about their own lives and the lives of others. Elephants have fantastic memory. Elephants accumulate and retain social and ecological knowledge, remembering the scents and voices of scores of other individuals and places for decades. They're able to keep track of the locations of companions in a procession or make subtle discriminations based on sight, voice, and scent between predators, even between different groups of people. The behavior of elephants suggests that they're able to use their long-term memories to keep score and to retaliate for wrongs done. An elephant's daily life constantly stimulates mind and movement. In the wild, everything an elephant does is an intellectual challenge that depends on space. Locating and manipulating a wide variety of food items, remembering the location of water during a drought, searching for potential mates, deciding where to go, whom to go with, whom to join and whom to avoid, discriminating between the individual scents, voices and appearances of hundreds of familiar and unfamiliar individuals, including friends and foes, relatives and non-relatives, higher ranking and lower ranking competitors, friendly and unfriendly other species, is a continually engaging activity. The activities experienced by a free ranging elephant motivate an active mind and keep a vigorous body fit. No matter what the arena, foraging, defending, socializing or reproducing, an elephant is guided by contemplation, choice, autonomy, will, purpose, 
and company. Space is the very foundation of an elephant's life. Without natural habitat, companions and autonomy, an elephant lacks purpose. What happens to the psychological and physical well-being of such intelligent creatures when we remove the possibility to search for or manipulate widely dispersed diverse food items? Or when we eliminate the multifaceted demands of being part of a large social network in a complex and fluid society? What happens when we remove almost all intellectual stimuli? No purpose, no choice, no autonomy, no company. Zoos state that they aim to meet the biological and behavioral needs of the species they hold captive. But when it comes to elephants, they are woefully inadequate. Despite the multi-million dollar exhibits, the comprehensive healthcare, lack of predation, drought and disease, captive elephants lack the very foundation of elephant life, space. Without space that allows for an elephant's way of being, individuals suffer from physical and psychological ailments that are not observed among their free living counterparts. Foot problems, arthritis, obesity, hyperaggression, killing of infants, stereotypic behavior, low fertility, difficulty giving birth and raising their young, infanticide. They express only a small fraction of normal elephant behavior and they die at a younger age. Elephants simply cannot survive and thrive in captivity. And it's utterly wrong for us to capture and confine them. Thank you. Dr. Poole, that's an amazing beginning for the discussion, and thank you so much for that. Uh, next up, uh, Dr. Keith Lindsay, would you like to operate from where you're sitting? I think so, yeah. Uh, are the microphones on? The microphones are on. I think the sh the sh you should be on. I'm on. On. Just bring it up on. a little closer, maybe. That's good. I'm on. Uh, many thanks, Joyce, for setting the bar so high. Uh, that I will struggle to reach that level, I think. Um, I'm going to carry on from some of the things that Joyce has raised. Uh, particularly, I'm going to be talking about um, elephants and ecosystems. Is there a PowerPoint or not? No? Is there? Awesome. Yep. Yeah. It's up there. I don't know how many people can see it very well. Cheers. Um, I'm going to speak to the PowerPoint as just background for my talk. I'm talking today about the essential relationship that elephants have with their ecosystems. Joyce mentioned, uh, mentioned very eloquently the, the role that li life elephants live in, in, in the wild. Um, they are uh, iconic animals, elephants, uh, for many of the reasons Joyce discussed. Their elephants in nature are particularly iconic. They're one, on the one hand, unique animals in, in many ways, but on the other hand, representing the conservation challenges that face uh, and the solutions that face a, a wide variety of other species in the ecosystems that the elephants share. Uh, they are among the metaphorical terms that are applied to elephants. One is that of a keystone. They are a keystone species and in ecological terms, that means important essential components of a diverse ecosystem. If you take the keystone out of, a, out of an arch, the, the arch collapses. And similarly with the keystone species, they play a pivotal role. Um, they're ecological engineers. Uh, the size uh, of an elephant, its food requirements, its ability to modify vegetation means that they, they have enormous uh, effect on shaping and dispersing vegetation and modifying physical features of habitats. So, you know, they're around the, the, the circle. Now, this is supposed to be click. I'm going the wrong way. Oh, no, I'm not. Keystone there. There's a keystone. Uh, there, is, there is a little diagram about uh, just some of the ways that elephants uh, 
act as keystones. They disperse seeds. They, they uh, create trails. They open water holes. They, they shape open habitats. They shape eco uh, habitats for other species. Um, if, like a keystone, if they're removed from the ecosystem, a host of changes will cascade through the rest of the system that will uh, threaten other species. Technically, really very competent here. Um, yeah, so in forests, examples, in forests uh, and savannas, elephants play crucial roles in ecological processes, uh, creating open habitats and pathways for other animals. In forest uh, areas, they find salt licks, which in Central Africa is called vise, which they maintain uh, as open and they dig for salt as water sources for a wide variety of other species who then use them. They make pathways through the forest. They disperse seeds as important tree species. And some of the tree species in the tropical forests in Central Africa are so large that they can only be dispersed by elephants. So those species, in order to survive and prosper uh, in a forest, require elephants to be there. Um, <coughs> in this way, they contribute to the maintenance of wildlife and plant populations. Um, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. They, uh, through, through the foraging, particularly on woody trees and shrubs, they uh, open up dense vegetation, create a diversity of plant communities on a broad landscape scale. So in a localized uh, scale, elephants, it may look like they're having an impact, a localized impact on the vegetation. The term impact implies negative. An ecologist would require that, would, would term that change. They change the structure of the vegetation in a localized area. On a, on a broader landscape scale, they create patchiness and variety. And uh, that variety, in turn, uh, promote diversity of other species, wildlife species. Uh, diversity of habitat types means that, that water-dependent, woody vegetation-dependent species uh, prosper in, in, in areas, in certain areas that uh, Elephants are not, or, or are present, or are not present, and different different patches of habitat uh, are created so that a range, a wider range of species, is present in areas where elephants are affecting a wider range of mammals, birds, uh, reptiles, and, uh, and invertebrates have been documented through through research on on elephant um, ecosystem, ha uh, their habitats, and the, the effect that they they have. There are claims that elephants are overabundant. There's too many elephants. Um, and indeed, uh, this is often seen in Southern Africa. In South Africa, particularly, there was a big debate in Kruger Park for decades uh, and some of the smaller reserves. Um, there have been this, th those, those discussions, those statements have taken the floor in the past. But more recent uh, penetration of ecological thinking into, into the mainstream has has, has debunked the ideas, the myths about the impact of elephants on large trees. Certainly they eat trees, but they eat them in areas near water. Uh, they eat the certain species and not other species. They, they're not perverse animals. They have behavioral uh, adaptations for foraging, for eating preferred food. And they, they, they uh, it's also not fixed. It's a, cha it's a changing process. Uh, the, the paper, Return of the Giants, which you can just about see at the bottom of the, the, uh, the slide there, uh, was written by a group of people, Norwegian and, and Botswana researchers, documenting how elephants uh, had been eliminated from ecosystems uh, during the ivory trade that, that was discussed uh, earlier uh, by, by Don, um, so that huge areas of Africa had very few elephants. At the same time, rinderpest was decimating the, the, the browser species. So trees spread across African landscapes in a way that they had never been before in the presence of elephants. When the poaching, when the hunting ivory trade was released, uh, at the same time as the slave trade, the elephant populations began to recover and return. The giants were returning to the landscape and changing them back to the way they used to look before they were wiped out. So. The state of an ecosystem 
landscape is not, a, is not fixed like an oil painting. It's more like uh, the, the image you get uh, through the looking through the window of a moving train. You're, you're seeing the state of, of, a, of, a, of a system that is moving and shaped by ecological processes through time as well as space. Elephants are, are a key part of that. The, uh, the key aspect of this and the reason why problems are seen these days with so many people and so few protected areas is mobility. And elephants need to be able to move, as Joyce mentioned, through space, uh, through areas of different uh, habitat. And the, the key issue is providing corridors for elephants to move between these patches of habitat to uh, allow elephants and other species to move. Uh, dispersal is a key ecosystem process and reduction of fragmentation and pro pro promotion of metapopulations allows natural processes to continue and e elephants ecosystem role as, as a keystone is preserved. Now that's, that's uh, looking at things from the, from the ecosystem perspective. From the elephant's perspective, as Joyce has mentioned uh, much better than I can, uh, describe it. Their bodies, uh, they've evolved in ecosystems. They have not evolved in zoos or safari parks. They, their bodies and their minds have been shaped by, by uh, their life, uh, the requirements of life in complex natural ecosystems. And um, so they spend, as Joyce described, they spend every day foraging uh, on a range of food, up to 18 hours, 75 percent of, the, of, their, of their total day period. Uh, feeding on uh, plant types and parts, uh, employing all sorts of methodology, which is learned from uh, older animals. And uh, it requires them to have active minds, to use those active minds, and provides continuous stimulation to them. Memory also plays an important part. And um, Joyce mentioned the movements that, that elephants make. They, they cover home ranges uh, to find seasonal food supplies, which is nef not necessarily predictable. You know, on a, on a, on a between years, uh, the rains may fall in different places uh, at different times. And the, so their food supplies uh, vary. The, the older animals are the repositories of that knowledge. Uh, they have learned where to find water and food supplies. Um, and they're essential to families and to bull groups. They, uh, they range over radio tracking, and this is an example from Amboseli National Park. Within the same population, some elephants had a few hundred square kilometers, others thousands of square kilometers in their annual home range. Uh, they can travel up to 30 kilometers a day, but a remarkable consistent number across a range of, of studies shows that they, on average, 10, 10 kilometers every day is covered by an elephant. Every single day, an elephant walks at an average of 10 kilometers. Um, this is contrasted with the conditions that are found in, in captivity, uh, and it's several orders of magnitude uh, greater in, w in the wild, the areas they cover. Uh, the image shows a, a sanctuary, which is you know, arguably better than a zoo or, or a safari park or other tourism opportunity. Um, and we're talking tens of thousands, if not millions times more area in uh, the wild than in captivity. Um, the conditions of captivity are tiny and barren and even in the better zoos and elephant camps, they're inadequate as Joyce mentioned. They offer no opportunity for exercise, mobility, behavioral challenges or choices over where to go and for food or where, with whom to spend their time. And when compared to the rich variety of wild ecosystems, they're, they're deeply impoverished. And these things give meaning to their lives, which is, this meaning is absent from uh, wild, from, from in, in captive conditions. So elephants cannot truly be elephants without a life spent in natural ecosystems. And equally, African ecosystems cannot survive in their current form without elephants. So concluding the, the decision that was made uh, by a majority of parties at CITES COP18, where we've just come back from, the only truly appropriate and acceptable conditions for elephants 
are in their natural and historical range. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, the speakers are being very well disciplined about time, so I thank you for that. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to tweet and do the, all those things that one does on a cell phone, uh, you will find that the system is called Elephant, and the code is need to be wild as one word. Need to be wild, and you'll find it on your system as Elephant. Um, I'd now like to ask Audrey Delsink to take over. Thank you, Audrey. Yes, the, the mics are very short range. You have to be about that far from them. They're not elephant friendly. They're not elephant friendly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want me? Go for it. Okay. You're going to have to give me one extra minute to coordinate this and this and this. Go for it, Audrey. <laughs> Uh, morning, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Don. Um, can I have my presentation up on the screen? Okay, while we're waiting, um, the title of my presentation is The Value of Elephants, Rands and Cents. Um, a little bit of background. I have been extremely fortunate in that I have been able to live for almost 20 years with and amongst elephants um, at a private game reserve up in Hoodsprate. And... Um, I'm going to steal Joyce's amazing title, which is The Coming of Age of Elephants, because I certainly feel that that's my life story. I lived, loved, and lost with those elephants, and um, through our immunocontraceptive program, um, I was deeply embedded in the behavior of those elephants and had to report on that. So um, the scientists will tell you that the way in which animal sentience or cognizance is measured is through a number of um, tests, including the mirror self-recognition test, the ability of an animal to be able to use tools, its comprehension of itself in space and time. And um, whilst those may be the scientific um, you know, uh, foundations of how to clarify that, I would challenge anybody to just spend time with elephants in the wild and uh, just see how they interact with their families. And I think uh, in the face of being very anthropomorphic, we would say that they are far much more like us than we would care to imagine. Um, Could we get the um, overhead up, please? Okay, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so moving on. Okay, so in terms of South Africa and its elephants, um, we have about 25,000 elephants in South Africa, some of which live in the Kruger National Park, as we know, and the rest in private and provincial reserves. Um, in 1968 to 1994, South Africa um, undertook culling in the Kruger National Park, and in 1995, a moratorium was then placed on the culling. In 2006, the then minister convened a scientific round table, um, basically because there seemed to be little evidence to suggest that there was actually an urgent need for a cull in Kruger, and that there were differentiated needs that were, um, or solutions that were needed to manage elephants. Um, and this led to the 2007 assessment. Um, so an assessment is basically a social process by which scientific information is made available to policymakers. And this assessment was the product of 45 institutions, 62 authors, three review editions, 73 reviewers. Um, it spanned a year, had three drafts and two reviews. So it was a really comprehensive process. And there are many of us on the panel and in the audience that were part of that assessment process. So out of the assessment, um, there were two important publications that arose. The first was the booklet, um, the Elephant Management, um, which is a scientific assessment for elephants in South Africa, and that was printed in 2008, and then the National Norms and Standards of Elephant Management in South Africa. So the elephant assessment delved into a wide variety of topics. Um, one of them was the economic value of elephants. So when we talk about the value of elephants, most people automatically jump to the rands of elephants. And um, 
the chapter that was authored by James Bluch note, um, basically, if you look at the summary, a whole, jump, a whole bunch of words jump out, and that is the um, total economic value of elephants, the damage that they cause, income from ivory, the conservation value, the economic value, um, the value as trophy animals, markets, and then of course countries such as Namibia um, and others that actually uh, use elephants for consumptive purposes. Um, and so that's in a nutshell the, the key essence of what came out of that. Um, just flagging, you probably won't be able to see the, the, the values on the screen, but the take home message from this slide is basically that when looking at consumptive versus non-consumptive use of, of elephants, and remember this was done in 2008, basically the take home message is that elephants are worth much more alive than dead. Um, and so there've been a series of uh, of advancements and um, developments with regards to this. And so in the literature today, you can find much more updated figures. But I think it's pertinent to say that this is a topic that's been on the cards since 2008. So it's not something that is new. Um, then when we look at the different values of elephants, the chapter also in the assessment that was authored by um, Wayne Twine and Hector Magomi, looked at interactions with people and elephants, and there's only a very small um, section that basically evaluates the other values of elephants. So now you're definitely not going to be able to read that, but essentially it looks at the aesthetic values, the cultural values, the ecological values, the empathetic values of elephants, their mere existence, um, their recreational value, and their scientific value. Um, and it, it delves into the relevance of those um, values for, for elephants. Um, so my colleague Antoinette, I'm sure, is going to be talking about that in a lot further detail as this is the subject of her PhD. So I'm not going to steal her thunder, but just again to highlight that we have had this thread, certainly in South Africa, thinking about different values of elephants. Coming back to the norms and standards, um, the norms and standards were and are a very progressive piece of legislation, certainly for South Africa and for the continent, because it, it, it determines the way in which we manage elephants. And within this document, there are guiding principles. And what is really refreshing about these guiding principles is that it talks specifically about elephants and their need to be managed in a way in which minimizes sh stress. Um, it talks about elephants as being intelligent, having strong family bonds, being highly socialized groups, having a charismatic and iconic status, um, that when it comes to decision making, it should be scientific based, um, but that we should safeguard their natural behaviors. So it also goes so far as to include the word sentient um, within you know, a legislated piece of, of documentation. So I think this is critical. Uh, the norms and standards are being revised. And again, a number of us on the panel and in the audience are part of that process. And it's good to see that the fundamentals of the guiding principles will remain intact. Um, okay, so in terms of the literature, we have also seen that there has been a challenge in traditional thinking and looking at animals um, as being mere than just cohorts that we share our existence with. We know that there have been a number of studies by Go, Bosch, Joukowsky, Wingfield and Romanovsky that examine the effect of chronic exposure to stresses and how these effects um, are associated with restricted space use and altered habitat preferences in the wild. Um, further afield, looking at um, the work of Gay Bradshaw and, and Linda, looking at how elephants actually exhibit post-traumatic stress disorder and how these effects last decades after the event of a traumatic um, encounter. Um, we look at the work of Shannon, who also looked at how acute social disruption 
um, in cognitively advanced species that live in close-knit kin-based societies also has considerable detrimental effects. And then we also see that often, in terms of how we manage elephants, we manage them on a scale that's not biologically relevant to an elephant. Um, and so this results in significant spatial and temporal mismatches. And then we also have um, organizations such as the Non-Human Rights Project, which petitions for common law writ of habeas corpus for elephants and other species. Um, Joyce has been actively involved in campaigning to free um, some captive elephants, um, as a number of others, and I'm sure that Prof. Bilchitz can speak more to that. But it just goes to show how things have evolved over time, that we are even at this, in this day and age considering personhood for elephants. Note that personhood has been attributed to organizations, um, to corporations, even to a river. And so why not to elephants? <clears throat> Oops. So at the African Elephant Specialist Group meeting that was held in Pretoria last month, um, Professor Rob Slotto, who is the co-chair co of, the, uh, of the African Elephant Specialist Group, actually introduced this concept um, of, of challenging how we look and think about elephants. And um, these are taken directly from his slides. And I'd just like to highlight some key things that, that, that he mentioned. And he said, we have to shift away from a focus on elephant issues and management of elephants to achieve an understanding of elephants' role in society in terms of human well-being and social uh, development. We need to understand and acknowledge social, societal attributes and risks. And paraphrasing quickly, he says that we need to interpret this, integra, interpret this um, looking at ethics, trust, culture, rights, including animal rights in a global and holistic manner. Um, he says that we have to do this with due respect to the dignity and rights of individuals, communities, and nations of elephants. Um, and I think this is extremely poignant and telling about where we are today, that whereas before we were shamed as scientists to talk about the well-being and the welfare of animals, and now in a forum such as the African Elephant Specialist Group, we are now encouraged to think about things differently. Okay, so quickly wrapping up, and this is why we as HSI have um, delved in a number of campaigns that specifically look at um, protecting elephants both in the wild and um, preventing them from situations in captivity. So I mentioned quickly about our immunocontraception program. So this is a program whereby we control populations humanely so as to avoid culling or unnecessary culling in these populations. And so this is a 20-year program with 28 reserves and more than 900 females under treatment. Um, we look at different methods of human-elephant conflict mitigation and problem-elephant control. South Africa, unfortunately, has a policy whereby an elephant is deemed as a, as a problem and can be legally destroyed, and actually very, very easily. Um, and so we're working specifically uh, with a specific, specific individual in a reserve up north called Riff Raff. He's kind of the poster child of elephant bulls within these age classes that we should be doing our utmost to protect and preserve because they are such a small fragment of the population. Um, oops, catching up. And then lastly, but not leastly, where is it? We are also working here in our own country in terms of um, the Johannesburg Zoo, where we're working with EMS and ERT, um, as well as specialists from the Elephant Specialist Group, um, Bannermill Trading, and Future for Wildlife, to try and get poor old Lummi out the Johannesburg Zoo. She's a 40-year-old elephant that was born and bred in captivity and has learned nothing but a life of sorrow, essentially, um, despite significant efforts on behalf of the organizations, as well as immense public pressure, um, a petition launched with the Gauteng legislature, and a scientific letter signed by elephant specialists, including those of us on the panel, um, 
Gauteng and the Johannesburg city parks continue to proceed and in fact have just adopted another two elephants to her prison, essentially. Um, and then, as Keith mentioned, we have just returned from CITES. Um, I know Lennon is here somewhere, I think. Um, no, there he is. Um, so together with the, the People in Earth Solidarity Network and many other Zimbabwean NGOs, Noma is here as well, um, we've been working very hard to ban the, the, the capture of wild elephants to captive facilities. Um, South Africa, uh, bigger part of Zimbabwe, is well known for this. At least 109 elephants have been captured and sent to facilities in um, Dubai and in China. Um, we submitted a letter to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, supported by 55 elephant specialists. So these are world-renowned uh, specialists in their field, again, many of them on the panel and in the audience, um, calling on why elephants do not belong in captivity, and Joyce beautifully summed that up um, in her opening. Um, and we also highlighted the, the, the platform by having a celebrity sign-on letter, which um, really raised the, the bar in terms of the plight of wild caught baby elephants, and this was done together with Bridget Bardot Foundation, Born Free Foundation, Fran Foundation France Weber, David Shepard Wildlife Foundation, and many others. Um, and Jane Goodall ended her voice, which I think is quite significant. Okay, and then, finally, <laughs> um, just to say thank you to the EMS and to all the attendees. And um, just in closing, uh, I found an article that spoke about the Non-Human Rights Project and Habeas Corpus for Elephants, and basically, the author said that as our understanding of the animal psyche evolves, so must our definition of what ethical treatment looks like. And I think that's a great way to close. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, you, we are live streaming this and we are trying to find the URL. I think it might end up on the screen at some point. Tell your friends, tell them to drop in and be part of our um, conference. Um, Yolanda, Pretorius, you're up next. Thank you. Hello. Can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Can everyone see me? I've got an abnormally large laptop. <laughs> okay. um, well, thank you, first of all, just for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, and I'm just going like, to uh, tell you about some highlights and things that I've noticed in the past 20 years that I've been researching elephants. I've been very fortunate that I've had... Um, I dealt with elephants in various conditions, right from captivity right through to free roaming, wild, very wild elephants. And um, so I'm just going to chat to you a little bit about what I've noticed, differences between the captive and the wild elephants, and how I see elephant welfare. Okay, so just to start off, um, why should we even care, you know, why, why care about elephants? And I mean, there's many, many things that makes them very unique, and I'm not going to go into detail onto that. Um, a, a lot of the speaker, other speakers already mentioned some of them. Um, but I think one of the things is, is, a, is an element of compassion and empathy um, that we see among them, and that I think we're busy losing in humanity, and, and um, that we can learn a lot from, from elephants in that respect. Um, so the other thing of concern... Sorry, that's... Uh, it's not connected, I must just <laughs> remember. <laughs> so the other thing of concern is that um, if we look at South Africa as a whole and we look at the conservation of the species, um, elephant as a species, um, it's frightening to see what is available in our country for elephants. I mean, so that's a study that we did, a survey across South Africa. It's wild elephant, not captive. Captives are not included here. Um, and it's incredible that it's only there, the Great Kruger, that there seems to be a little bit of significant space. But it's, it's these fragmented populations occurring everywhere. And even though the population in South Africa as a whole is, seems to be growing, it, uh, um, elephants as a whole, is, they're busy decreasing if you look across Africa. And um, the frightening thing is 78% of our uh, elephants in South Africa is in the Greater Kruger. And then 60% of the other populations um, have less than 30 animals per, per uh, population in, in these small fragmented reserves. Okay. And um, that raises issues of elephant welfare. And um, so the way I see it is that, that it's, it's along a, gra a gradient. Elephant welfare ca can be ma measured along a gradient. Sorry, I'm again forgetting about this one. 
<laughs> Elephant um, can be, uh, wealthy can be measured along a gradient from excellent to poor. And if we look at the factors that, that, that I've now noticed in, in, in my career that is really impacting on, on, on whether an elephant is under poor or excellent welfare conditions, the first that comes to mind is the frequency and the level of exposure to human activity. Um, and so elephants in different situations are exposed to people and human activity and noises around lodges. Tourists um, wanting to view elephants in a zoo, you know, it can get really uh, quite loud. So um, with this particular factor, there is also an aspect of habituation. Um, so it's not necessarily all, all that bad always. Elephants do get habituated to an extent to human activity. But then we go to, you know, when things go wrong, the consequences of, of, of people harassing elephants constantly is that it sometimes leads to aggression. And, and we, we all know that there are these cases where elephants attack vehicles or people, and it's because they just push too far. Um, sorry, that was again. <laughs> um, so it leads to aggression, and, and, and that, that's what the consequences of one of those things. Then we look at um, the second factor that's actually even more important, and that is... Um, the intensity and frequency, uh, the intensity, freq frequency, and artificial nature of human intervention. So it's not just the fact that people are viewing elephants. It's also the fact that people are directly impacting on elephants because we control them in so many ways. So, and that, again, ranges from, from um, elephant fencing that's put up um, or, or fences around lodges to keep elephants out. People shoot them with, with chili balls to keep them away from from um, lodges, we call her elephants. That's a traumatic event every time that happens. Um, people, elephants in captivity are trained sometimes in very cruel ways. We capture orphans from the wild. Um, we translocate elephants. I mean, that upside down elephant is not maybe, you know, it, we, we see it as good, but you know, it, it's all trauma that we, we're busy um, exposing these animals to. And then there's also the effect of poaching, killing, culling, all of that. Is, is how we impact on elephants, and that will affect the, their welfare. Okay, and the consequences of that, the most extreme case that I've witnessed myself and that I was involved in, and probably the saddest thing of my career was this elephant. Um, I studied for 18 years, and he was killed by another elephant. But if you look at the history of what's, what went on in that, on that reserve, it is horrible what they were exposed to. And eventually, they started killing each other. So... Um, there are horrible consequences to these things. The next important factor that we can look at is um, the completeness of the social structure. So we do realize that elephants you know, live in very close-knit societies. It ranges from, from the core of the mother and the calf, very close bonds, the family, their, their, their sisters and aunts and everybody. And then when these families get bigger, they split into bond groups, but these bond groups like, keep on associating with each other. And um, so it's a very complex society. And even with the bulls, there are hierarchies at larger scales. And the bulls know exactly where they fit in. And the older ones, you know, teach the younger ones. And the consequences of not, that not being there is what we've often seen on some of the, uh, uh, in the past and some of the reserves in South Africa um, where there weren't like proper bull hierarchies and these orphan elephants were introduced into these reserves. They started, you know, uh, just misbehaving and started killing rhinos. And it's because they, there were no older bulls to suppress the release of testosterone. They went into these premature mass cycles and it really um, led to a lot of uh, problems. Um, and only after introduction of older bulls where, you know, did, did this behavior seem to um, calm down. Okay, then... The other thing that's uh, quite important is space. Okay, so we, we've heard some, with some of the other speakers, our elephants need a lot of space. And linked to that often is um, environmental enrichment, but it, which is not always the case. But generally, the more space you have, you know, the less you have to provide in, in environmental enrichment. Um, and, but that's... Um, so uh, environmental enrichment, when it's very high, you know, your, your welfare tends to be... Uh, better when you've got a lot of space, welfare issues is not so much of a problem. Also connected to this is the, um, the uh, dependency of the elephants on, on food of humans. So that's also very, very closely linked to, 
to available space. So the more space you have, the, the less dependent an elephant is on a human for getting food and water. But the, the more you can find them, I mean, even some of these small game reserves, they have to feed the illies in the, in the dry season because they, they, uh, else they, they really um, hammer the vegetation. So um, they become more and more dependent on people for, you, for their water and food requirements. Now, the consequences of small spaces and very little in environmental enrichment is what some of my colleagues have also mentioned now, is the stereotypic behavior that they then display. When, they, when they're really in these small confined areas and there's no, not, not a lot of stimulus and, and everything, they start developing very interesting behaviors like head bobbing, where they just stand and do this all the time, or they start rocking. Constantly rocking. It's, it's like somebody in an asylum, okay, that you know, you, eventually they just get to a point where they yeah, <laughs> do funny things. So if we put all of this together, sorry, I, um, if we put all of this together, um, and we see the ideal situation is that we have all our elephants having, you know, a low frequency or level of exposure, low intensity uh, or frequency of um, interference. We've got complete social structures. Um, we've got environmental enrichment. Um, you know, because they're living in the wild and they're in wild open spaces. Okay, that's the ideal. But the reality of the matter is wherever I've gone working with elephants, this is not reality anymore. There's almost no populations like this left on earth. Okay, so all of them are impacted to some extent. And it's also not an aspect of just looking at, you know, a zoo, small space, you know, it's an unhappy elephant. You can have a relatively small sanctuary or area with sufficient um, environmental enrichment, or not sufficient, but relatively um, uh, uh, environmental enrichment. You've got um, at least some social structure going, maybe a little family herd. Um, the people are, you know, careful with how they manage the elephants and how they expose them to people. Um, compared to an, a, a game reserve, which might have more space, but where the elephants, where there's not a proper uh, social structure. Sorry, oh, sorry, let me just, this thing keeps confusing me. So that's the example in yellow of, of um, elephants in a small available space. And they can have um, some of the other components of what they require. But then you get a case of an elephant that's got large, more space, but they don't have any social structure. They're constantly being harassed with collaring, with tourists um, harassing them. They came from culls as orphans. They don't have social structure. All of that. And it might eventually lead to the fact that the elephants in a smaller space might even be better off than the ones in a bigger space. Okay? And so it's all relative. And we have to, to look at all these aspects together. Uh, all right. Then, just to quickly highlight the behavioral differences. How am I for time? Okay. Two the, minutes. the behavioral differences between captive and wild elephants that I noticed. And these are just things that stood out for me. And one of the things is, um, is that wild elephants seem to be more sort of aware, alert, um, sensitive, in a, in a, if, if that's the right words to describe. Um, so they move quicker, they respond quicker to stimulus. And when you look at these captive ellies, um, at the bottom, for example, that the, above is wild, at the bottom is captive. You see that these captive elephants, they often have these sort of drooped faces, very listless, don't move around a lot, don't really react to anything happening around them. And, and that stands, really stands out if, you, if you've worked with bo on both sides. You, you really, it, it, this, this difference is quite marked. Um, then, um, wild elephants have typical ways in which they respond to a disturbance. And it ranges from an initial assessment where they would like, go, okay, there's something funny, let's smile, lift the trunk, raise the, the head, you know, spread the ears. And, and it can go right down to um, where they eventually do, does, uh, they display how, what they're going to do with the, when they get you. So bend down, tusking the ground when they're really stressed, or they flee, or they charge. Okay, so, so these are things that wild elephants typically do. But what I've also seen now with captive ellies is that they kind of behave out of context sometimes. So they will display some of these behaviors but in a total different context. And so it's almost like there's a level of confusion that they haven't really been taught properly on, on, on how to behave correctly. And there's even been some interesting scientific studies done on this um, where um, one group compared elephants coming from calls as orphans that didn't have a proper social structure, who was exp exposed to a lot of trauma, 
um, and compared the way that they behave to playbacks from um, elephants um, that they know and elephants that they don't know. And they compared this with wild elephants in Ambuseli. And the interesting thing is that in Amb Ambuseli, the elephants did what you, expected is when you, uh, what you expect them to do. So if you play in a familiar elephant voice to them, you know, they were kind of curious and, you know, who is this or what is, where is this elephant? But when you play an unfamiliar elephant voice to, to the wild elephants, they bunch together. It's a defensive reaction, like who is this? What's going on? What, what is this elephant doing here? Whereas the Pilansberg elephants weren't very consequent in the, in the way that they responded to, to different playback experiments. So, so um, they would bunch together with a familiar elephant and, and you know, not when, when it's an unfamiliar elephant. So it, this, this also indicates that they, they, they don't behave the same as, as captive elephants, or, or, or free-ranging free wild ele elephants. Um, Vocalisation seemed to play a role. <laughs> okay, I'm almost, almost done. Um, so a study that I did... Uh, on, on elephant vocalizations. I could see that uh, with lots of tourist pressure, elephants tend to growl and roar more. Um, the, the calf moan, moans more, and that's because the mother gets uncomfortable and she doesn't want the calf to drink, so the calves complain more. Um, but there's also a very big learning component with communication skills. And some studies have shown that you know, elephants can actually start imitating trucks and, and uh, uh, human speech and all of that. And, Basically, when I started working or being exposed to more to captive elephants, I've also noticed that they speak a little bit of a different language. Okay, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, those are just the studies that was done. Um, temporal gland secretions uh, is also an interesting thing. It's like elephant tears. Between the eye and the ear, there's a gland that secretes, and it's not just males when they are in mast, females also secrete, but it's very much linked to emotion, emotions of elephants. And um, it's basically some females secrete easier than others, like some women cry easier than others, and some, um, on a bad day, they would secrete much more than on, on other days. And it's basically very much related to um, the stimulus and I just came up with this sort of hypoth hypothetical model that we're actually busy testing with one of our studies with the Elephant Reintegration Trust. And that is that along with, uh, as, temporal gland, uh, as the stimulus increases, the temporal gland secretion would increase. Um, but with captive elephants, you find that they don't really, the temporal gland secretions doesn't increase with, with the stimulus um, being, uh, in increasing. It seems almost like that mechanism switches off and it takes a lot more before they secrete. And um, I think it goes so far that in, in very horrible conditions where they are really traumatized constantly, the mechanism switches off and it's like a robot, they don't secrete anymore. Um, and yeah, that's just some interesting thing. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, just with the uh, changes in Behavior of elephants, there's just two points that I want to highlight. We did a study where we reintegrated some elephants from, captiv uh, from captivity, from elephant back safaris, back into the wild. And the thing that have stood out for me and that I'll never forget is that, is that they, um, once they released, they didn't go back to the bomas. The bomas in the stables where they stayed for 20 years long, they did not return. So um, that shows that they don't want to be there. Okay? And, and the last one is... Um, the stereotype behaviors, stereotypic behaviors that I measured while they were still in captivity, there were some of the females that were rocking and, and showing these type of behaviors, that all disappeared once they were back into the wild. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Yolanda. It, um, that just proves that you can't stop a wild elephant in terms of time. <laughs> um, yeah, straight into internet. Thank you. If you would take over from Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Antoinette. I'm the director of Bring the Elephant Home, and I'm currently doing my PhD at the University of KwaZulu-Natal under supervision of Professor Rob Slotow, Dr. Michelle Henley, and Dr. Kevin Matteson. Um, oh, well, the presentation is coming. Um, but yeah, I've, since 2002, I've been working in Thailand at first uh, in elephants in captivity to focus on elephant welfare standards. And since 2007, a community-based uh, conservation project to reduce human-elephant conflict. Um, so in my presentation, you will see quite a few pictures of Asian elephants. Sorry for that, but I prefer to use my own pictures as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I've witnessed a lot of abuse, obviously, by working in those uh, captive industries. Um, 
I've seen elephants that were carrying tourists on their back with a broken leg. Uh, I saw elephants that were just caught from the wild and their bodies covered with wounds, uh, wooden pins behind their ears to prevent them from moving, to just get used to having tourists on their back to continue uh, riding. Um, and I always struggled a lot with how is it possible within a culture that has such a high respect for elephants, how is all this abuse happening and how is it so difficult to speak out against this? Um, I've noticed that as soon as you try to discuss this, uh, you're immediately put in yeah, the animal activist corner and it's very difficult to start a debate. And because of that, um, it, the cooperation is very difficult. So organizations are very much working by themselves and it's very difficult to discuss issues like this um, openly. So what I'm mainly focusing on with my PhD now is, um, uh, yeah. Um, is the value for elephants uh, in society, like how can we make elephants more relevant and what arguments are needed within the society that makes impo uh, elephants important to change practices like this. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. um, so what I found very interesting in a recent uh, court case here in South Africa, uh, the lion bone uh, court case, they decided that the welfare of animals is constitutionally important for two reasons. And one is to prevent moral degradation. Um, I think that's very important um, if we think about exploitation, the mistreatment of animal for one's personal benefit. Um, like if you look at elephants and if you can find a, a strategy that really contributes to conservation goals and to human well-being goals, that has a much more peaceful and uh, sustainable uh, future. The second one was that we have to consider the intrinsic values uh, we place on, anim on animals as individuals. Um, so if we consider the value systems of people, the values that people place on elephants, if we look at all those different values, shouldn't elephants um, have the same type of protection of, for example, uh, children or slaves or other um, um, individuals that um, that need more protection. So if you consider that, uh, if you consider like national v value systems on elephants, maybe we have to think of a better protection for elephants and better strategies for elephants to survive. Um, so my focus is mainly on uh, human elephant coexistence. Um, so in the past, elephants uh, had the chance to roam freely uh, many areas in the world. Um, but and yeah, that's an option that few elephants nowadays have. Most elephants are living in human dominated landscapes. About a third of the Asian elephants live in captivity. Um, so I can imagine what that does to moral uh, degradation. So yeah, competition for space and resources forces elephants um, yeah, to, to roam to plantations, to find food and water sources in human dominated landscapes. And obviously that causes a lot of tension between elephants and people. Uh, people chase elephants away from their plantations by using firecrackers, uh, gunshots, even uh, fire or vehicles. And these type of conflicts, um, I'm very interested, like what is, how can we increase tolerance uh, for people? How can we, what are the drivers of peaceful coexistence? So for um, one of the studies I uh, conducted in Thailand, I, I, I looked at what makes coexistence possible. And not surprisingly, um, it is yeah, obviously if people have uh, less income or if they depend uh, on agriculture and they have crop raiding elephants, those people are less tolerant uh, towards elephants. Um, another very strong driver of coexistence was the benefits that people gained from elephants. Um, so benefits, initially I thought uh, that should uh, be a financial benefit. Um, obviously if people make money from elephants in tourism or in other ways, uh, they are more supportive of elephant conservation. But surprisingly, the cultural values and, for example, pride in hosting volunteers or getting involved with conservation work was a very strong driver of uh, tolerance towards elephants as well. Um, yeah, through conservation work within communities, we noticed that as soon as there are a little bit of support and if people don't feel like they are completely alone, depending on their livelihoods, um, and they can't find a way to, um, yeah, to find a peaceful way to live with elephants, that that's the moment that uh, the conflict can escalate. 
but by having their voices heard and by working together on sustainable solutions, for example, by installing beehive fences or uh, chili fences, it doesn't solve the uh, conflict completely, but just because there's something in place and the voices are heard and they get income from, uh, from those kind of uh, methods, that really makes people accept when there is damage from elephants. Maybe we reduce the conflicts, but th the biggest difference is that people tolerate elephants more. Um, yeah, so if we look at all the different values, um, obviously the financial values is uh, one of the biggest one and like moral and legal objection beside, uh, aside. Um, yeah, hun um, tourism, trophy hunting and, um, um, sorry, <laughs> and poaching are like the big earners. But beyond that, there's like a huge spin-off of industries that are related to elephants. So it's restaurant, lodges, uh, guides, uh, researchers, m media, arts, crafts, infrastructure, even the development of harbors and schools. Uh, um, that whole spin-off effect of elephants has a huge uh, financial value for, uh, for society. Um, but yeah, to, to put price tags on elephants on an exploitative uh, approach, that's like putting a plaster on a gaping wound. And I believe that if we are to look in elephant conservation in a more holistic way, and a way that is in line with international development goals, we must at least be aware of all these other values have. So also in the cultural, social, and spiritual context. Um, so, uh, elephants are keystone species, well, Keith talks about this in detail already, they're very important for the ecosystems they are part of, many other species depend on elephants, and beyond that it's also because there are elephants, many areas are protected, we think about creating corridors to connect areas, and all this, the role of elephants as an ambassador for conservation is so important for our biodiversity goals. Um, then if we look further, um, is this working? Yeah. Um, then there are the connection that we feel with elephants, just the feeling of knowing that there are elephants in this world, all the different stories that we remember from our childhood of elephant graveyards, of elephant stories about their memories. Um, it's, it's very clear that we feel a benefit from just knowing that elephants exist and just yeah, of, through their existence values. Uh, elephants are highly respected in Buddhism, uh, Hinduism. Um, yeah, th uh, and because we see elephants as something special, that's like further uh, enforced by using all these different elephant images. Uh, and because of that, we see elephants as something special and that we really want to continue existing. And then finally, I believe that uh, we should really accept that elephants uh, and the rest of flora and fauna in the world have value on their own right, the intrinsic values. Um, I believe that, um, yeah, that, that's the value in respect uh, to their relationship to us. Um, in the past, it was very accepted that we could um, dominate other species in the world, but I think we finally have to accept that um, other species, and especially elephants, um, has rights. And if we accept that nature has rights, we human have a responsibility. Um, so now how do we boost chances for elephants to survive? Or how do we boost chances to prevent elephants in captivity? Um, and how do we make sure that elephants are more relevant and that po policymakers um, will agree that we really have to put practices into place for, to secure a brighter future for elephants? But through experience in Thailand and um, what I'm focusing my PhD on is that the change will not happen unless we integrate the social and the ecological system. So if we redesign elephant conservation in the light of social justice, equality and social upliftment, if we make sure that conservation goals also contribute to human well-being and human uh, happiness, so strategies that contribute to the happiness of elephants and people, that uh, change will happen. So very quickly, this is the model for uh, my PhD. Uh, what we often see, um, it, it's a ter theory of change model, but it's grounded in a co-adaptive uh, management system, but there are three pathways. The first one is um, ecology. Oh, sorry, that's this one. 
And what we often see is that many biologists and conservationists or park managers are mainly focusing on that left side, on the ecology. And even in South Africa, we fence parks off and the benefits are not flowing freely to the society. So if we look at other pathways like community engagement and the benefits that people can have from elephants, then true sustainability can be realized uh, and that contributes to international development goals as well. Um, I will quickly go through that um, from our project in Thailand. So through community engagement, if people are really involved in creating conservation strategies, if their voices are captured, if we ask them if people really want to live with elephants, and if they do, what we, do we need to do to enable that? Then people have ownership, uh, partnerships are created, um, people have options to develop skills and to manage their situation by themselves. Uh, and through that, uh, conservation efforts are organized and they're all owned by the local people themselves. So people are coordinating, for example, tree planting event to create corridors, they're hosting volunteers, they're setting up beehives, they're selling honey, so they're making income on the way and they're developing skills. And then the human um, benefits from this, there's so many different benefits that we can gain from elephants. Um, I talked a little bit about this already. I quickly go through this. Uh, I just did a workshop um, with quite um, an impoverished uh, community at the border of a game reserve in South Africa. Uh, are elephants important to your culture? 74% uh, found elephants very important. There was a big discussion about why, for example, they believe that elephants um, should be in the wild. Uh, they don't want to see elephants in zoos. They feel that they should have access to reserves to see elephants and learn about the role of elephants in um, the ecosystems they are part of. Um, so there's a very strong emphasis of that we need to focus on happy elephants and happy people. Why do we need happy elephants? Because of all these different values. Without that, if we don't consider the right of elephants, if we don't see them as environmental ambassadors, uh, as uh, yeah, helping us to reach our conservation goals, but even community development, gender equality, if we have dignity and respect for the elephants, we can reach all those uh, sustainable development goals. Okay, I quickly go through this. Um, yeah, and then finally, I just want to start uh, to end this um, presentation with, like if we often think about elephants as a metaphor for a just society, a society that appreciates empathy and compassion, a society that embraces coexistence, in which strangers are welcomed, the elders are respected, and resources are used wisely. These are all values that are increasingly absent in our own competitive society. So we need to change our way of thinking, and rather than placing a price tag on the elephants, we need to re-establish our connection with it. We need to re recognize the strength and the beauty and recognizing the inescapable facts that animals, people, plants, it's all one. Uh, by recognizing the elephant's right to exist and their full value chain, elephants will contribute to a better world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Antoinette. Um, the presentations, obviously, there's much more that each person can say, so thank you very much for being so concise. The, we're going to open uh, a question space between, at, at this panel, at this level. Um, what, the presentations will be compiled at the end and put together in such a way that everybody can get access to them. <clears throat> the URL, the, 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 the live screening will be available, so this information will be out. Um, we have until 12 o'clock, and, and how it's going to be is that if you have questions from the floor, um, WhatsApp again, 071-771-2814. <clears throat> Ross will, will coordinate those. But um, we, we really need to have a discussion among panelists in terms of what has been said. I'm sure you all have stuff you want to ask each other. Um, <clears throat> and I, I just want to kick that off. Um, very briefly, with a question to, to Joyce um, about epigenetics. I, I'm a criminologist, and I was looking at aberrant behavior among adolescents in prison, and uh, I got to epigenetics and, and early pre- and postnatal trauma that mothers um, uh, uh, have uh, leads to uh, major problems of behavior among the young people. And uh, 
the problems are mainly with the, the prefrontal cortex, and um, elephants have a very developed prefrontal cortex, and I would be surprised if um, we don't have the same problems with elephants when the mothers are, have birth trauma, particularly in captivity. Joyce, I wondered if you could expand on that, perhaps. I'm not sure I, I can, really. I mean, I, I think your, your premise is probably correct, but I don't, uh, I, I don't think that, or maybe Gay could speak more to it. Um, but I don't know what evidence we have, but I think it's quite likely. Thank you. Certainly, well, I could just say something maybe on, say, uh, Gorongosa, where where we're working now and and that population went through of course uh, the the civil conflict civil war where 90 percent of the population was killed and now we're some 30 years on from that period uh but the elephants are still um very fearful very aggressive toward uh toward people and of course uh, the that that includes the young ones um, now, whether that's that they're learning from their mothers or whether there have been, um, you know, subtle changes in the epigenetics, uh, I, 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 I'm not able to, to answer that. Thanks, Joyce. Questions from the panel? And if you don't have any questions from the floor, Joyce? Um, all right. So I, I haven't had many questions from the floor, but... Um, Part of the objective is to try and get conversation going among the, the panelists. So I have some indiscriminate questions to just to get us started. Um, so maybe make a note and, uh, and then just to answer very briefly. Um, given what we know about elephants, is there ever a reason to put them in captivity? That's one question, ever. Um, Keith, this question is probably for you. Uh, what would you say to Southern African governments uh, that are using the too many elephants argument to justify uh, all kinds of lethal intervention under the guise of sustainable use. Uh, and then, yeah, why, uh, or this question is for you and is from the floor, uh, why do we have Lamy and two other elephants in Joburg Zoo, you, you did mention it, given uh, our progressive norms and standards, how, how are these so openly violated? Um, and then a, a big question that, and this came up through all the presentations, was how do we decrease the fragmentation of the landscapes that seem to lead to so many of these problems? Uh, and then, and Sunet, maybe you could touch on this, you know, there does seem to be a connection between the moral degradation of humans uh, and the enslavement of animals. Um, and maybe there's a, a, a comment to be made on, on why South Africa is such a violent society. You know, we, are we, is there a, a feedback loop going on here? Um, of course, we don't have to have a, uh, a comprehensive answer to that, but I think it's something worth exploring, maybe. All right, so who wants to take the first one on? Keith. I'm at, the, I'm at this end, so I can, I can kick off. Uh, the question you directed to me about too many elephants um, is an interesting one, and it's been used uh, not only in South Africa, but also recently Botswana, and in my experience over decades in Botswana, it was used when there were 10,000 elephants, then 30, then 50, then 100,000 elephants, always too many. Um, but what was different about Botswana compared to South Africa is that the area that they inhabited is not fenced, and the elephants uh, dispersed, and the actual density of elephants per unit of land has not really changed very much in northern Botswana. Um, it's usually, uh, in South Africa, the, the difference is that the, the animals are fenced inside uh, smaller areas. Kruger, however, is a huge area. Um, I was at, at the CITES COP talking to Ted Riley from Swaziland, and they, have, they talk about being an elephant range state. They have elephants in a, an area of 10 square kilometers. Uh, and they're talking about too many elephants inside the, the 10 square kilometers. Well, I think they're right about that. They shouldn't have a fenced area, a small fenced area with elephants inside that cannot move. And I think that applies to a lot of the, the smaller reserves. In fact, the isolated reserves dotted across uh, South Africa. Uh, it's uh, foolish in the extreme to put elephants, 
to take elephants from one place and put them into a fenced area where they weren't before, you're only going to have trouble a little bit down the line in terms of your objectives. And that comes to the, the nub of it. What are the objectives for, for the area? So it's generally about trees. You know, It's not the fact that there are too many elephants. We don't like seeing them. It's like they eat trees. Now, I don't know what elephants are supposed to do uh, when they see a tree and they are hungry. Are they supposed to not eat it? It's, they've evolved to eat trees. So <clears throat> the difference is that in the past they could disperse. In a park the size of Kruger, they have, when it was managed uh, up in, in during the 60s, particularly when they had this era of scientific management, so-called, their idea was to manage it like a commercial cattle farm. There were water points every few kilometers, uh, burning uh, all sorts, targets for the number of correct number of animals. And at that time, it was 7,000 elephants in the whole of Kruger. And they uh, strenuously, um, happily, whatever, culled elephants every year to keep them at that number. And it, it essentially kept any feedback between the food supply and the elephant numbers from happening. So it was like keeping the lid on a pressure cooker. And as soon as the idea was uh, realized that we shouldn't be doing this in Kruger, um, the elephant population increased dramatically. But it was con combined with closure of water points, the recognition that landscape diversity is created by having places where elephants feed and, and where they don't go near water, so away from water. So, yeah, I think that too many elephants, certainly in any of the small reserves, any elephants is too many. You shouldn't have them in small <coughs> areas. You had a question about how do we decrease fragmentation, corridors between them, if possible. So I wouldn't be against small reserves if there were corridors where they could move between them. Yeah, maybe I just uh, will uh, talk a little bit about this issue of captivity. Um, uh, I think, first of all, we need to define what is captivity. Um, because in my mind, like I said, in some of the situations or reserves that I've worked in, um, an area that is, that is a few thousand hectares, um, where elephants are constantly harassed, constantly um, uh, interfered with at some level, um, that is still a captive situation. They, they can't make free choices. They can't move where they want to. So um, I think, you know, it's important that we, we decide what, what do we see as captivity. And for me, and that's where the, I think the emphasis should be on the elephant welfare, because it's very difficult to put a size of a reserve, you know, on, on, on what, what, what it should be. Um, and, and what is good for elephants or what not. So I've seen very happy elephants in relatively small reserves, and I've seen uh, in, a, in a little bit bigger reserves, I've seen very, very unhappy elephants um, under very poor welfare conditions. Um, but you do see the tendency is that the more um, overall, you know, the smaller the space, it's just much more difficult. It's a huge animal, they, they have, they roam very widely, and so then you do require, you know, then it becomes more difficult. And there tends to be more human uh, control and all of that going along with it. But it's not as clear cut, it's just, this is the size. Thanks. Um, um, I just wanted to add to that to say, I think people tend to forget that 70% of Africa's elephants are transboundary populations. So when we claim ownership of elephants regionally, I think we need to be very careful. Um, and so that's why you can't instill management principles in one zone and not expect it to have implications and unintended consequences in other zones. Um, I think also we need to remember, as it's been repeatedly stated, that ecosystems are about flux. And uh, so the very issue about South Africa and its elephants in small populations is that we are unique. We are one of the only nations that can legally own an elephant or a lion or a rhino and stick a fence around it and suddenly we PhD owning game farmers. Um, and so I think that's why, certainly in terms of immunocontraception and population control, the reason that we do that in these situations is because it mimics natural processes. It mimics lengthening of intercarving intervals. So again, it's trying to get back to the previous state in terms of nature. Um, the question about 
the norms and standards being progressive and so why then do we see these issues such as LAMI and destruction of problem elephants is, is crucial. It, it's true, we do have very good norms and standards, but when it comes to captive elephants, they are seriously lacking. We don't have proper norms and standards for elephants in captivity. Um, these are guiding principles for the way in which elephants are managed, um, but it doesn't speak to those animals that are already present in these captive situations. And in fact, we see that the levels of captivity, as Yolanda has alluded to, um, are varied. So basically what happened in the case of Lummi is they basically just took two elephants that were, for all intents and purposes, captive, but had a much, degree, a much larger degree of freedom and, and um, sort of roaming and free, free contact, but they were captive. So they moved captive elephants into the zoo situation where they're now living in a half hectare hectare enclosure next to Lummi, they haven't been allowed out. They're not allowed inside the elephant homes or the houses. Um, and so that questions again how we grade levels of captivity and what is acceptable. So there is a gaping hole in terms of, of, of that component of the norms and standards. Um, so yes, while they are progressive, they need a lot of work. And also I think we need to be clear that whilst it's national norms and standards, we have nine provinces, and each province is responsible for its um, sort of permitting process and authorities. And unfortunately, they're not aligned. And uh, this tends to be a big, big problem. Um, the one last statement about when situations are acceptable and appropriate, I think uh, coming off the back of CITES, which was very interesting, was that the original proposal put forward by the African Elephant Coalition was that there is no situation that is acceptable and appropriate for ex situ translocation. Um, after much debate, it was then agreed that the wording that um, exceptional circumstances would be included. And the term and the definition of what exceptional circumstances are still needs to be defined. Um, and luckily this will be with the oversight of the African Elephant Specialist Group and the Animals Committee for CITES. But I think, um, you know, some extreme conditions or examples such as a war-torn country, perhaps that would be seen and deemed as exceptional. But I think from the evidence that we've heard, I don't think we can rationally say that there is any suitable situation. Thank you. Do you want to ask me or? Um, okay, about uh, moral degradation. Um, I'm also part of that whole process in South Africa to, do, to develop a national elephant strategy. Uh, my supervisor is facilitating that process. Um, and I think that whole strategy or the way forward of looking for cons elephant conservation strategies that reconcile conservation and human well-being goals, I think that's a very good way, way forward to avoid moral degradation as well. And by having elephants in uh, captivity, I don't see how that would fit that model because there's no way that you can have all those uh, contributions to a, a, better, a better world. Um, yes, yeah, so I think like the, what links the questions to all of us, like for example, creating corridors or having elephants in small pockets, um, like if there are ways to open up protected areas and create corridors and having communities being part of that whole process and have uh, allowing cultures that value elephants so high have access to, to spend time with elephants and learn about elephants in their ecosystem, in the wild, uh, that is so important. I think that is the way to bridge that gap and to make sure there is a more united, united way forward um, yeah, a better way forward for, for, for people and elephants. Okay, thanks. Joyce, is there, do you want to come in on anything? Yeah, I guess I was going to just talk about some of the um, orphanages that uh, exist. Uh, there are two uh, orphanages in, in Kenya now. Um, and that might be one case where it's acceptable to take elephants in captivity with the idea that you are going to uh, rehabilitate them, rewild them afterwards, that, you know, when they wouldn't be able to survive on their own. Thanks, Joyce. 
I, I want to ask just quickly a different kind of question. Uh, the, after the UN Biodiversity Report came out, and there are so many people at the coalface of the crisis, um, and, and what I'm finding is that the stress levels among those people who know what's going on but are not getting that information across is very high. In fact, uh, there is a group getting together in, in Cape Town of people to support each other for the stress levels, and they're all environmental scientists or, or communicators. I just wondered if th th those stress levels are having an impact on you when you can't get through to the, uh, of a situation, or are you feeling comfortable that you are getting through? Uh, may I just comment on that? You're talking about us, how we feel uh, yeah, fighting for elephants. It, it's, it's rough. I mean, sometimes one wakes up feeling really uh, hopeless and um, there, there are really difficult days. And, and, uh, and then, you know, you wake up and you go back fighting, but it, it isn't easy. And I, you know, sometimes you really feel like you need, uh, need support. Yeah, yeah, people need to look after themselves, Keith. I would say something. I mean, I was just, I just spent two weeks at the, uh, CITES Conference of Parties in Geneva, and I had been at the previous one in, in Santon and Joburg uh, uh, three years ago. And I must say, I was um, encouraged by the, the spirit that was uh, generated at, the, at this recent Conference of Parties. A lot more countries are coming together to uh, recognize that, that nature you know, needs, needs taken care of, that, that endangered species are threatened by trade and they need to be um, protected. The precautionary principle is at the heart of the CITES treaty. It was, was in force and giraffes got more protection and tortoises and uh, sharks, not, not to mention elephants. And there were advances for elephants as well, uh, not least the, the decision about the Kept, you know, taking elephants into captivity from, from the wild, but also in terms of uh, uh, domestic ivory markets and stockpiles, things have moved forward. There was, a, there was a big backlash from particularly, I must be said, South Africa and, and uh, other countries in South, Southern Africa. Um, and that needs, that needs attention, and I think there needs to be a a way, looking for ways to make dialogue, uh, open up dialogue, if at all possible. Certainly at the community level, I think is, is there's prospects. So I was quite encouraged by, and, and I was encouraged by uh, Latin American countries. There's groups of Latin American countries who are conservation conscious, um, as well as, as this African Elephant Coalition was recognized, 30 plus countries uh, speaking together. Um, very powerfully. So, you know, if, and I'm encouraged by people attending this, this meeting, to be honest, uh, very much. Thanks, Keith. Uh, you want to? Yeah, all right. So I th there are a lot of questions coming in from the floor. So just to assure you that, uh, that we'll try and get to them uh, later in the day, but we are going to be quite strict on time. Otherwise, Don's going to punch me in the ribs. Um, so, so I think we're going to Call it there for this session. But not quite. Um, well, just I, before we finish, <laughs> just before tea and coffee happens, I'd like to ask uh, Kinesius uh, Dambakurima to give us from Zimbabwe uh, his Voices of African Wildlife from Zimbabwe. I, I'd like him to come up because he's got a poem for us. Where is he? You have the mic, sir. <laughs> Use electric mic for that one, it's up to you. Okay. You're on. One, two. Oh. All yours, go for it. Two, two, two. Okay. One, two. What is there? Three, four. Um, hi, everybody. It's time to face the problem. Poaching, canned hunting, 
pale trophy hunting the threat to animals wildlife crisis are these not just the symptoms that we are fighting we can't keep talking talking and talking fighting the symptoms and ignoring the sources it's time to face the problem and eliminate the root cause calling trophy hunting meat eating the threat to animals wildlife crisis are these not just the symptoms that we are fighting we can't keep talking talking and talking fighting the symptoms and ignoring the sources it's time to face the problem and eliminate the root cause save our animals i'm sorry <laughs> i have to do it another time i've gone blank <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kenesia. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is now tea time. We've got 15 minutes. We're coming back here at 12.15. Thank you very much. Uh, the books on your seats are for you um, to take home. If you like, they are, there's the book sales outside, plus tea and coffee.